Welcome. Great to be with you today. In a moment, we're going to continue our talk from this week, drawing a clear distinction between the twisted view of predestination, which is a poison pill, versus uh, uh, what the Bible really t says on the subject, which is wonderful and thrilling. But uh, also, I want to tell you, you see all the phone numbers, you can reach me. Uh, and we got a lot happening in this program, and so I have something unrelated to the topic at hand, and yet extremely important. I'm going to talk about what happens in Canadian prisons, and uh, this is a uh, issue that affects uh, maybe women more than men, or that affects both. And so I'm glad that Elizabeth Oluidi is with me here to make any observations, so I keep myself uh, very uh, balanced in my approach. So uh, this was a headline recently, Canada allows transgender prison transfers. Today in Canada, you could be biologically and anatomically male, but once you identify as female, you could be moved to a women's prison and vice versa. The change in policy came in December 2017 when prison officials were ordered to treat prisoners according to the gender they self-identified as. Here's an excerpt from the government's directive. Correctional Services Canada, CSC, has a duty to accommodate based on gender, identity, or expression, regardless of the person's anatomy or the gender marker on identification documents. This includes placing offenders according to their gender identity in a men's or women's institution. To be clear, <laughs> this very much includes convicted sex offenders. In other words, male convicted sex offenders now say they identify as female, move to a women's prison. The prime minister fully supported the change as a show of support and advocacy for LGBTQ2, uh, and I hope I got everything in there. As you can well imagine, questions arose. How easy would it be for such transfers to be approved? The National Post reported that in 2022, a new directive gave prison officials the power to reject transgender inmates and their transfer request, and all requests were to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. I suppose the government were overwhelmed with their own directive. Well, this, in my opinion, was good. It was a small step, but still a step in the right direction. But the Canadian Bar Association <laughs> was not in agreement, claiming that it was unconstitutional for prison officials to make the assessment solely based on biological sex. <laughs> I don't think anyone is surprised that there are already cases of severe criminals who were convicted as males and have transitions to a woman's facility while in custody. While you could argue that this entire matter is uh, unconstitutional or constitutional, however you may for all parties, legal arguments do not help victims that are assaulted. Major newspapers, such as The Guardian, The New York Post, Wall Street Journal, and The Times, have reported assaults in women's jails by transgender convicts. And so I get asked questions about this. What do I want to say about this? Well, I want to say, first of all, I think the world has gone crazy. But uh, beyond that, I want to say, male and female, he created them. It's a phrase from the Bible. And, and this biblical quote is, of course, today considered criminal by some feelings, trends, or personal preferences and convictions do not alter biological realities. Just a few days ago, or a few weeks ago, I should say, St. Joseph's Catholic High School in Renfrew, Ontario, had a 16-year-old boy, student in the school, arrested for voicing his belief in male and female. He was quickly released, but the legal proceedings are continuing. Yes, it seems the world has gone crazy. While the male may, certain males, may feel more aligned with being a woman, you know, people can have all kinds of feelings and ideas and vice versa. This doesn't change biological realities. I, I, we offer no condemnation to anyone. But I, I only wish that people will not take steps to irreversibly damage themselves. You, you know, the number of testimonies 
from people who received gender altering medical treatment and are now angry at doctors and social workers who advise them to do so, it's a growing number. And I would say all prisoners, including women, prisoners deserve some human dignity. This is a trademark of a civilized society. As deplorable as those criminals may be, we treat them with some respect. And, and while legally allowed, I submit that it is morally corrupt to willfully expose incarcerated women to the high possibility of sexual assault or rape. And I think the world has gone crazy on this issue. But uh, Elizabeth, before I get on with the topic more theological today, um, any comment here? I'm a man speaking to this issue, so you represent uh, the female view here, if I miss something. <laughs> I mean, I'm, you said it pretty much all, but one thing that we can really, I think we should focus on is that, as you said, all people deserve dignity and mm -hmm. to be protected. Mm -hmm. And even though folks are imprisoned, some people may believe that if you committed a crime, you deal with whatever repercussions come with that. Mm -hmm. There is still a level of requirement for them to have mm -hmm. some basic human rights to speak up and advocate for themselves. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's coming to mind is we discuss a lot of, you know, trans women, male, born male, transitioning to women. Thanks for explaining that, because yes. I get confused Yeah, myself. some people get confused. <laughs> yeah, okay. So if you're a trans woman, you were born male, transitioning to become a Thank woman. Thank you, I got it. They want to transfer to these women's facilities. Yeah. We're hearing more and more about the reports of what's going on, the assaults yeah, that are yeah, happening, yeah. women are coming out, even correctional um, officers are saying that this, we can't have this happen, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. too much paperwork maybe. But we haven't really, really focused on the opposite side, where there are there trans women or trans men, so rather women who are transitioning to men, transferring to male prisons, yeah. and how that looks. Well, maybe there aren't very many, or maybe there aren't any. I, I don't know, but it would be interesting to hear the comparison. Yeah. And thank you for explaining this. I, I always have to stop and think mm -hmm. when you say a transgender woman. Oh, oh, it's it's someone who's a biological male, yes. you know, because. Uh, just trying to get the, the lingo right. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's really, th this is a subject, I don't want to say there's hope for everyone. We, we don't offer condemnation. We understand people have different feelings, but uh, in all of that, God wants to help you. But at the same time, the world has gone crazy. I just heard about the swimming team. You know this Leah Thomas, mm -hmm. the transgender woman, right? right? Did I get that right now? I, born male. Yes. And, and, and they were talking about in the dressing room how the other girls in the swimming competition was, uh, uh, they were upset as he was walking, he, she, the transgender woman, was walking around naked, penis and everything showing. I guess you can use those words these days on a Christian program, little kids know them. So, 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 so I'm saying like, isn't there anybody thinking? I, I, I have high hopes that this whole issue will eventually wear itself out, but I don't know. What do you think? I, I don't. I don't know about wearing itself out. I think it's only <laughs> okay. just getting started. I'm too. Okay, so <laughs> maybe a little too optimistic. Uh, yeah, I was too optimistic, <laughs> and maybe you're too pessimistic. <laughs> <Maybe>. So <laughs> hopefully, the truth can be in between us, Elizabeth. But thank you for your perspective. I better get on with my topic at hand. Okay, so thank you so much for being with me here on the set. So we are talking about something else: predestination, and I've suggested in the title. And by the way, the topic we just addressed. Let me know what you think. Love to hear from you. Uh, we've been talking all week about that uh, the beautiful truth of predestination, as Paul teaches us to the Romans and the Ephesians, it can become a poison pill. And that poison pill is that God determines individuals to be saved, predetermines before they're born, to be saved and those who will not be saved. Uh, you know, some say, well, you know, we, we're predestined for, uh, for salvation and some are predestined to be in hell forever. That's it. That's what the Bible says. You know, people say, that's what the Bible says and not so fast. Others will say, well, we're not robots. The Bible says we have to make a choice. We have to believe. And then they say, well, God chose us and we chose God. And, and it all ends up in that poison pill. Second part of that poison pill is unconditional selection that God has randomly selected some for salvation and some for perdition. That is just, just randomly, what, what, what an absolutely cruel thought. 
that God would allow billions to be born who God has already predetermined are going to spend eternity in, in an everlasting torment in hell. That's what these teachers are saying. And, and you say, well, just, I don't believe that, Peter. And, well, there's thousands of churches in Canada whose pastors graduated from theological institutes that are based on this idea of this teaching. Uh, they may not bring it up on a Sunday morning because it might, if they did really preach what they learned and what they stand for and the doctrine that they've signed on to, uh, it might not be good for church growth. So they polish it up best they can uh, because this idea of individual selection and individual exclu exclusion incriminates God's nature. It incriminates the nature of God who is love. Not only that God has love, because that would mean there would be a supply of love that could be either high in supply or low, but it incriminates God who is love and reduces what Jesus has done for the world. I quoted uh, earlier in the week a preacher who is of this persuasion, of this ugly, very, very ugly doctrine this poison pill. John MacArthur, known to some, I think to the world at large he's not known, but to some Christians, he, he preached this sermon about how God has already judged America, there's no hope, there's no hope for people. And, and, and the newspaper article headlined it, 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 it's too late for America, but not for the elect. You can see it on your screen. Now leave it up because I want to comment on that. Because this kind of encapsulates what this ugly doctrine, this ugly poison pill is all about. So that you see, I'm not addressing some theory. There are many, many well-known preachers that preach this horrible teaching, uh, this poison pill that some are predetermined to go to hell. You see, some people look at that. When John MacArthur said that, he said, oh, it's too late for America. Uh, you know, you know, but not for the elect. They say, oh, that's radical. Oh, I wish my pastor would talk like that. I would. Do you think that statement is radical? Is that the gospel? Is that where you want to go and tell all your neighbors, knock on the door and say, hello, it's too late for you unless you're one of the few chosen, one of the few elect? Is that what you want to share? Maybe that's why you don't want to share Jesus Christ at your Christmas party or your birthday party or whatever your vacation time. If that's the ugly news you have to bring, how haughty of a preacher like John MacArthur to stand and say, I'm speaking for the Almighty and I'm saying it's too late. You who might cry out, overcome with life's heartaches, it's too late, except if you are in the selected group. What a disgusting, destructive teaching. And the incrimination against God's nature. Okay, enough about that. You can take that down now, that ugly quote. And you can check. You can probably find that sermon and say, I'm not misrepresenting it. The truth is that what the word, the Bible teaches of predestination, it's wonderful that God has selected the entire world to be included in his salvation plan. It's not about individual picking this one or that one. Remember that you once Gentiles by birth were without Christ, aliens uh, from Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, you've been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both groups, meaning the Jewish people and the Gentiles, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, that in himself he might make the two into one new humanity, establishing peace and might reconcile them both to God. There you have it. And the context of these verses is one of the four times, actually twice in that context, the word predestination is mentioned. It's only mentioned four times in the whole Bible. And, and, and so two of them were right here. But then people come with, they say, well, I object. Well, what about this verse? And this is a favorite of people who preach the poison pill of predestination. Jacob, I have loved, but Esau I've hated. See, it says in Romans 19 that Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Well, let me tell you, first of all, that the Bible does speak in, in 
uh, in a way that is an exaggerated language. It's common in the Bible. Because it also says that God loves the whole world. And so it's hyperbole. For example, Jesus used a similar hyperbole in Luke 14. He says, anyone comes to me doesn't hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, in his own life also he cannot be my disciple. So there it says you should hate your wife, you should hate your kids. We all understand that's uh, hyperbole, that we're speaking in, uh, in comparison, your commitment to God and his purpose. Everything else is hatred. So when it says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, it's not that God is discussing how he selects individuals. He is saying to the Jewish people, look, I'll do whatever it takes to show mercy to everyone. And so God says, I hated the arrogance that Esau had against God's will. Jo Jacob was the one chosen to be in the lineage of Jesus, not Esau, even though Esau was the oldest. But then he goes on in, in Romans 9 and says that this whole thing was so that God could show mercy to everyone. And so for a season, Esau made the wrong choice, but then later on, Esau himself received mercy. God gave land and prosperity to him. Uh, God, God blessed Esau. And so we can't make this some statement that has nothing to do with you and I, that God was uh, speaking through Paul to convince that the Israelis and the Jewish people, that God would do whatever it takes to include the whole world in his salvation plan. He even says, you know, Pharaoh's heart was hardened so that he would, you know, fight the people of Israel so that God would establish his program of mercy for everyone. It was always about that. It says in Romans 9, 21, doesn't the potter have power over the clay for the same lump to make one vessel? for honor and another for dishonor. Notice it says for honor and dishonor. It doesn't say for honor and for destruction. If this was talking about that God has chosen people to go to hell and burn forever, <laughs> that, that's, you wouldn't use the word dishonor. You would use the word dis, 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 destruction. This is speaking about that God calls different people to different things. Some people may have a calling that looks more honorable and others, they do a more, more menial job. But it doesn't take away from the main teaching here that God's plan was always to show mercy to everyone. And, and Romans 9, I'm still in that same chapter where he talked about Jacob and Esau and Pharaoh and all that. He, he, he begins to summarize it towards the end of the chapter. He says, God also says in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved, who was not beloved, and should come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you're not my people. There they shall be called the sons of the living God. So he's talking about, I'm not talking about one individual selected for heaven and another one for hell. I'm talking about the world here, that there are places and nations where it was said of them, they don't know God. But in that place, in that nation, in that large area where people didn't know Jesus Christ, they shall be called the sons of God. It's all about inclusion of the world. And in, in Romans 10, the next chapter, he, you could read the whole chapter, but he really summarizes it so beautifully. He says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all of call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He says that there's no distinction. So the poison pill that I refer to here on the title behind me, that is this idea of distinction. The very thing Paul says, there is no distinction. Whoever can call on the name of the Lord, yeah, there's no distinction. Everybody's included. Uh, this poison pill is that yeah, you are excluded. No matter if, what you do, you, you, God is predetermined to send you to hell. What an ugly, monstrous, genocidal idea. That is not the God revealed in Jesus Christ. No, the God revealed in Jesus Christ shows us that whoever you are, you may think you're chosen, you may think you're not chosen, you may think you are whatever nationality you have, you're included. So, so how do we summarize this? Well, I say, uh, the teaching on predestination that Paul gives us 
it's not this exclusion of some people. What Paul is saying is, number one, God does what he wants, even if we don't agree. He's saying to the Jewish people, hey, you, you don't like this. You've been God's chosen people, and now you hear the news that God has not only predestined you, but he's predestined the whole world. You don't like it? Well, God does whatever he wants. <laughs> but if anything's going to stop him, if he has to harden Pharaoh's heart for a while, he'll do that just to get his plan done. So whatever you think, he's going to get his plan done. And the second thing we learn is predestination is not about choosing or rejecting individuals. God predestined the whole world, Jews and Gentiles, to be in his non-discriminatory salvation plan. That is, that is the thrilling good news, not that ugly poison pill. And then we establish here in the book of Ephesians that the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ demolished any spiritual differences between Jews and Gentiles, chosen people and not chosen. So I'm not talking about differences in culture and how we look. or No, 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 no. It, I, I said any spiritual differences. As far as access to God, it's not chosen or not chosen. We're all chosen. And if I didn't say it right that way, let me say it a different way. Anyone can come to God through Christ. That means you can come to God through Christ. So this is giving you some thoughts in this area. And I want to uh, just uh, let you know, get, get the whole teaching uh, that I'm doing on this More God, Less Religion. There's four CDs. I might even put in a bonus one there for you. Available for a gift of any amount, for any amount. And, and this teaching is designed to help you see that delicious gospel. Put the picture up of that delicious looking branch of apples. I've been using this illustration. Say, this is how the gospel is, like the most beautiful looking apple. You would bite into one of those apples and you would say, ooh, I can imagine. Maybe you're salivating when you see that picture. You can come back to me. You say, that looks like a delicious apple. But then religion it causes, uh, finally, I got you back to me now. We've been looking at the apple. You almost forgot what I'm talking about. That apple was to depict the, the, the beauty of the gospel, the freshness of it. But then religion puts worms in that apple, worms, like the poisonous idea. Show, show the picture, but do it quickly. It puts worms, poison pills into the gospel. And, and I want to encourage you and tell you, don't believe what the worms of religion have done to rot at the gospel, but receive the gospel revealed through Jesus Christ. Bite into that apple and be saved. Would you want to receive this good news? But maybe you want to pray with me. Say, God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Help me, Lord, to really see how good your gospel is to me, that I'm included. I'm speaking to somebody who say, I, I feel excluded. I've never been good enough. You are included. Just say, thank you, God, that I'm included in your plan of love and hope and faith. And Jesus, come and live in me. I, I, I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Now, if you do that, uh, I want to send you a little booklet, and you can see it on the screen there. It's available to you, and uh, maybe you can download it. We can send it to you in the mail. I think you'll be really blessed by that. And one more time, I also remind you, make sure you get the More God, Less Religion teaching album. Uh, and so uh, it'll be a blessing to you and to others. Now watch this. The VIP family is about believers making their life count for Christ. The VIP family is a partnership with the Lord Jesus Christ and with one another. We believe in the cause of Jesus Christ, and together with Him, we are an unbeatable team. VIP stands for very important person and for visionaries in partnership. Billions of precious people don't see what Jesus Christ has done for them. Our mission is clear, to open their eyes see the light of Christ's gospel. Millions receive hope and healing as the gospel touches their hearts. 
Jesus saves. Yes, Lord. Jesus is Lord. Yes, Hundreds of thousands of pastors are trained. True apostles and true prophets reveal Jesus Christ. Seven Bible school campuses equip students across Africa and Asia. Millions receive follow-up for new believers. Millions more are reached by television and social media campaigns. Persecuted Christians receive help and much, much more. The VIP family is about compassion for others and then about taking a step of faith. If we have a heart for God and the lost, this is the ministry to uh, support because they reach so many millions of people. Make your life count. Participate in daily gospel advancement. Participate in prayer and in convenient and constant giving. Many give monthly by automatic deduction from a bank account or credit card. Whatever your gift, you will participate in making history among those who have never heard the gospel. Call now, 416-745-1820, or give online, give.peteryoungren.org. We are embarking now upon a, a great campaign schedule. As I'm speaking, you can see some of the pictures of campaigns in Asia, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, so many other countries, Africa, Europe, all over the world, you make this possible. And here's what happens. When, when often, most of the time, more than 50% of the people in one of those meetings will respond to receive Christ. That, that was a shocker to me. You know, I was used to church services, maybe one, two, five, 10, 20 people might respond. There we see thousands respond night after night. And I can't do this without your help. So thank you for stepping up to the plate, so to speak. Th thank you for helping us become a monthly partner. You help our Bible schools, our graduates, all the things we're doing to advance the gospel. I need you to take action. So please uh, go to your telephone, call the Grace Prayer Center, or give online. You see the information right there. And I say thank you. Thank you in the name of Jesus. And remember, miracles happen when you know how much God loves you. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039, RPO, Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A 2W1, or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.